Buenas tardes, uh, mi nombre es Russell Keith McGee. I come from Wajuk Noongar country, uh, otherwise known as Perth, Australia, the little red pin down the bottom corner of the map there. Uh, I'd like to thank the entire PyCon Colombia team, uh, especially Gonzalo, for the invitation to speak here today. I have had the opportunity to speak to pieces of the Python community all over the world, uh, but no matter where, where it is, it's an absolute honor to be able to add another pin to that map. But who am, I, who am I anyway? Uh, well, in my day job, I am a senior data engineer at Savata. We are a market research company. We use Python and data science to help brands to understand their customers. They give me the flexibility to come to and attend conferences like this one, so that's something I'm very thankful for. If you've heard my name before, it may be because I've been involved with the Django project for 13 years. Uh, I joined the core team in 2006. I was president of the Django Software Foundation from 2010 to 2015, and I served on the Django Technical Review Board for the 1.7 through 1.11 releases. Django is a big part of the broader Python ecosystem, but it's not the only part. Django isn't the only Python web framework, and web programming isn't the only thing people do with Python, as we've heard over this weekend. In my current day job at Savata, I actually don't use Django at all, but I do make extensive use of NumPy and Jupyter and Pandas and the ecosystem of tools around those libraries. And there are many other uses of Python. There are projects for using Python on embedded devices. There are libraries for performing astronomical calculations, biotech, gene sequencing. It's used as a scripting language for operating system automation and as a teaching language. None of this happened overnight. Python as a language is 25 years old. It took maybe 10 years for Python to gain significant traction in our industry, and another 10 before it gained really widespread support. But that persistence is paying off. In September of 2017, Stack Overflow published a blog post talking about the huge growth of popularity of Python. Uh, Python is the red line on that chart. Uh, JavaScript is the yellow line with modest growth. The other languages, Java, C Sharp, PHP, C++, are all fairly static over that period of time. The growth that Python has shown here is impressive. Interest in Python almost tripled in six years. And that's not we went from one user to three users, so we have 300% market growth. The starting point was a market the same size as PHP and C++. Stack Overflow's projection was that this growth curve wasn't going to flatten out, that we're still in the growth phase. And the Stack Overflow numbers are backed up by other sources. Uh, as of January of this year, Python is the number three language on the Tyobi Index. It's a measure of pop uh, programming language popularity. It's jumped two places since the Stack Overflow report was published. It's also worth noting where other popular languages fall on that list. JavaScript is at 6, Swift is at 15, Go is at 16, Ruby is at 18, Rust is at 33. And the popularity numbers drop off exponentially, so there's a two and a half times factor difference between Python at position three and JavaScript at six. Now, these are metrics, and they are popularity metrics at that. They are not objective measures of truth. These numbers do not mean that Python is the third best language or that other languages are rubbish. The idea that you can reduce the entire programming landscape to a single popularity metric is laughable. But metrics like these do serve as an interesting starting point for a larger discussion. Take a look at the Tyobi list again. Notice the languages on top, Java and C. Notice the languages immediately below Python, C++, Visual Basic, .NET. They are not the hot languages that set Hacker News abuzz with excitement, but they are languages that are going to be with us for a very long time. What is remarkable about Python's success is that it has achieved its current level of popularity without being officially blessed or supported anywhere. Python isn't installed by default on Windows, and it's only quite recently that you could use Python on Windows reliably at all without spelunking in the registry. Python is installed by default on macOS, but it's Python 2.7, and Apple isn't showing any signs of upgrading that anytime soon. C was, and still is, the default, system, uh, default language for cross-platform systems programming, and C++ builds on that. Java is the default platform for enterprise, whatever that means. C Sharp and Visual Basic are Microsoft's chosen platforms for system and user code. But Python? Python doesn't have a historical legacy like C. It's not popular because it's just there and installed everywhere. And no single company dominates or controls the platform the same way that Oracle controls Java or Microsoft controls C Sharp. 
That means, as a community, we're not beholden to the interests of any one corporate master. But that's also a problem. Just as we're starting to reach this point of popularity, the computing market is changing, and we don't have a large player making our case. When Python emerged as a language, a computer was a large box that sat on your desk or maybe in a rack in a server room. Over time, that box has gotten a lot smaller and you started carrying it around in your backpack, but it was basically still the same operating system, Windows or a Unix derivative. Over the last 10 years, we have seen the emergence of a whole new class of computing devices, much smaller and often portable, things like phones and tablets and watches and set-top boxes. And we've seen the emergence of the web browser as a computing platform in its own right. But you can't use Python on any of those platforms. Never mind that it's hard to get Python going on Windows or Mac for the first time. You can't install Python at all on an Android or iOS device or in the browser. These new devices are becoming ubiquitous, and they are replacing laptops. My son started high school last year. His school requirements said he had a computing device, but he doesn't have a laptop. He has an iPad. Phones and tablets are achieving market, pen market penetration that desktops and laptops have never seen. And at the same time, vendors are changing the way that they look at programming languages and positioning themselves for a world where laptops either don't exist or are niche devices. On desktop platforms, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, you're free to use whatever language you want. Yeah, okay, sure, there's preferred languages on each platform, but you can install other language runtimes and any other language can target your installer tooling. But that's not true on mobile platforms. The mobile vendors are pushing very specific ecosystems. Google wants you to use Java or Kotlin. Apple wants you to use Swift. The platform tooling only supports one language. Installation occurs through an app store. If you want to use something outside the blessed languages and tooling, you are completely on your own. The flip side of Python's independence from corporate masters is that there isn't a corporate master making a hole for Python. And as a result, Python isn't a solution that is available in this new world. I think we need to start seriously looking at the future and asking what we see as Python's role in that future. If we're intending for Python's success to continue, how are we going to maintain and grow our market when the devices people are buying can't run Python? What is the future of Python? The existence of this platform trend is one of the reasons that I changed the focus of my open source contributions a few years ago. I developed my reputation working on Django, but these days I'm spending most of my volunteer time on the Beware project. For those who haven't come across it, it's been mentioned a couple of times this weekend, um, for those who haven't come across it, Beware is a collection of open source tools and libraries for creating native user interfaces in Python for desktop operating systems, but also for iOS, Android, single page web apps, and other new hardware platforms. And a key part of that work is getting Python to run on those platforms, on phones and tablets, at all. Now, this is a big project. Uh, I have been working on Beware for almost five years now, and there are days where I really do feel like the mythical Sisyphus pushing his great big boulder up the hill. So why bother? Well, yes, OK, it is a big task, but I think this is a huge opportunity for Python as well. Right now, if you want to write a mobile application, you have to write it twice. You have to write it for iOS, and you have to write it again for Android. Personally, I think we are more likely to see Satan ice skate to work before Google supports Swift on Android or Apple supports Java on iOS. It is simply not in their commercial interests to allow developers to easily support the competition. So, if you want to write an app that can be used everywhere, you need a cross-platform solution. Now, okay, you might be able to write your app as a web app, and that will be a good, a good solution for some people. A lot of applications really should just be good, well, mobile-enabled web pages. But there are things you can't do with a web page. Good operating system level integration with phone features like cameras and GPS and accelerometers don't exist in the web browser. Even basic things like device level persistence in the browser are a real pain to work with. You can work around those limitations with things like PhoneGap, Cordova, or other web bridging frameworks, but I am also yet to see a web-based app that offers an end user experience, either as a developer or as a user, that is even vaguely comparable to a native application. And the market that needs the ability to write easy cross-platform mobile applications is also a market where Python has an existing advantage. Python is big in education. It's a language used to introduce people, especially children, to programming. Teachers want to engage their students, and one way to do that, let them write programs that run on their phones. Python is also big in scientific disciplines, a demographic that is smart and capable, but is motivated by what they are studying, not by programming. 
They just want the damn thing to work. And they've got a huge body of domain-specific tooling that is already grounded in the Python ecosystem. They're not just going to abandon that part of the ecosystem. These markets are already using Python. All they're missing are the tools to use Python on mobile. So that means there's a window of opportunity. Python could be the language that allows this part of the market, a not insignificant part of the market, to write mobile applications. There will always be a need for native iOS and Android programmers writing professional iOS and Android applications. I'm, here, I'm talking about the long tail of application developments here. The scientists, the students, the prototypers. Python could be the language for getting things done in mobile programming in the same way that it's a language for getting things done on desktop platforms and for exactly the same reasons. It's a language that is accessible to newcomers but powerful enough for heavy lifting purposes with a huge ecosystem of support tools around it. But this user base is going to disappear if we don't come up with a story for Python on mobile. There are already cross-platform toolkits in other languages. So we are already fighting against capabilities that exist elsewhere. If other language ecosystems develop a better education story or a better scientific support libraries before mobile, Python develops a mobile capability, this is a market we run the risk of losing. My personal aim is to make Python as simple for developing native apps as Django makes web development. And while we've still got a way to go before that's true, I think it is possible it's not even that far-fetched. But there are some impediments in our way. One of the biggest actually stems from the focus of the Python core team itself. To explain what I mean by that, let me pose a question, and I'm going to come back to this a couple of times in this presentation. What is Python? Now, conceptually, Python's a programming language we all know and love. But in practice, from a technical perspective, it means first and foremost CPython, the de facto reference implementation of Python that runs primarily on a Unix-like operating system. And in a world that's dominated by servers and laptops that expose a Unix interface, that answer is great. It's even fine for iOS devices, for all the layers that Apple puts on top. If you squint enough, iOS is a Unix as well. And you can compile CPython for iOS and write Python code that deploys on iOS without too much difficulty. However, there's a difference between something being possible and something being easy and officially supported. It is possible to build CPython for iOS, or Android for that matter. I have written a bunch of scripts that do that. The Kivi project has similar tooling. But it's not something that's available out of the box. You can't download an installer from python.org. It would be nice if this was something I didn't have to maintain externally. I have, many years ago, submitted a patch for CPython to add iOS to their build system. But engaging the core team around that issue hasn't been especially productive. To be fair, this is significantly on me. I have not been pushing this issue very hard. I submitted that patch several years ago. At the time, some legitimate high-level project management questions were raised. I haven't pushed to get answers to those questions. But part of the reason I didn't pursue it vigorously was that the level of engagement I've seen around this problem was indicative to me that the, core Python, the C Python core team either doesn't see this as a major problem that needs to be addressed, or they don't have the resources to address it. And as a result, I haven't put a lot of my personal resources into pushing that particular boulder up that particular hill. While what I, what I have works for my immediate needs right now, if that changes, I might do more to engage with the core team. What's a little more concerning is that this isn't just a problem that I have, and it isn't specific to mobile devices either. For many, many years, the installation story for Python on Windows was abysmal. Windows as a platform just did not get attention. There was an installer, but you needed to do a lot of manual tweaking. The Python execution story assumed that script execution on Windows works the same as it does on Unix, and it doesn't. It wasn't until Mark Hammond and others took a look at the problem that anything really got fixed. The, this problem also manifests in API design. Uh, while the Unix support layer of Windows has changed and gotten a lot better in recent years, the true Windows native API and event model is fundamentally different to the one under, under Unix and POSIX. But the implementation of the banner feature of Python 3.4, async IO, is very tightly bound to the Unix event and socket model. In theory, sure, it's got an API with a base class and a Unix-specific implementation of that base class, but the design of the base class almost assumes that the implementation will be Unix sockets. That means integrating the async IO event loop with a, a native user interface event loops is relatively easy on Unix and macOS and iOS, but on Windows, it's really hard. There's a fundamental design disconnect. 
The problem also exists when you look at Python as being more than just C Python. Now, when we say the Python core team, it's easy to think of that as a language specification team, but it usually effectively implies C Python as an implementation. But there are other implementations of that language spec, Jython, IronPython, PyPy, and others. And if you're working on an alternate implementation of Python that doesn't use C, the C focus of the Python core team can be a problem. Uh, Masi Fielkowski is a member of the PyPy core team, uh, the JIT optimized, uh, optimized Python interpreter. And he recently tweeted, my prediction, the inability for the Python community, especially numerics, to support multiple faster runtimes will lead to the decline of Python in scientific computing somewhere in the future. To clarify what I mean, the reliance on the C Python C API, which exposes interpreter internals, is a major impediment against all other implementations, real or hypothetical. So, in the opinion of someone well versed to speak about high performance computing, the focus and approach of the C Python core team could lead to the decline of one of the very communities that has been a major contributor to Python's success. In my opinion, what we're hitting here is a fundamental problem with the way Python is developed. It's reactive not proactive. If we were to take a poll of the Python core team and ask, is it important for Python to work well on Windows? I would be willing to wager that every single one of them would say yes. But if you ask the same developers, are you personally motivated to make Python work better on Windows? I would bet the answer will be no, except maybe for Brett Cannon, Steve Dower, Eric Snow, and Dino Veland, the members of the core team that work for Microsoft. And even those responses would likely be qualified by whether or not Windows integration was on their product roadmaps for their work at Microsoft. The development process for Python is primarily reactive, not proactive. It tends towards addressing immediate problems that exist right now or directly serve the current interests of those few employers that are paying for contributions to Python. It is less effective at addressing strategic problems that we might foresee. Free and open source projects talk about contribution being driven by people scratching their own itches. That people use a project, find a problem, and they resolve that problem by contributing code to add a feature or fix a bug. Scratching itches is a good way to rationalize why someone will fix one specific bug or add one specific feature. But it doesn't explain how you ensure that the strategic and forward-looking plans are made and explored. Sometimes fixing a problem requires a significant chunk of time for a redesign or a refactor. How do you find that time? It takes a lot of discipline to put aside what you personally find interesting and compelling so that the long-term interests of a project are looked after. It takes a lot of effort to convince your boss to fund an engineering activity that has a long-term payoff for someone else. When Google or Dropbox hires Guido, for example, they do so primarily to ensure that a tool they are currently using continues to be useful. Any new or novel applications of Python, applications that expand Python's reach or its usefulness, those are of secondary interest. And what happens when you know you've got an itch, but you don't have the skills to scratch that itch? It is very difficult to fix problems on Windows if you don't own a Windows laptop or if you're not sufficiently familiar with the Windows ecosystem to judge if something works the way a Windows native user would expect. What happens when you don't even realize you've got an itch? Like, because of your lack of training in a particular area or exposure to a particular audience, you don't even realize that a problem is occurring and it needs to be and can be resolved. The current Python core team is primarily driven by the needs of the C Python implementation. And in the desktop-driven world, that's what most people mean when they say Python. But it can't be true of Python going forward, because CPython may not be an option on many of the platforms of interest in the future, or at least not as currently framed. Now, I also want to be very, very clear here. I do not say these things as an accusation or as blame. The Python core team is doing an amazing job doing the absolute best they can with the resources that they have. I raise these issues as something that I, as someone outside the CPython core team, perceive as a strategic risk to Python as a whole. I raise them as issues that I see as an impediment to progress on my own projects and where I see the future of Python heading. I want Python to survive and thrive, but I also know this is a goal shared by the many people who work on the Python core team. I will not for a second doubt that the many people in, who work on Python, from Guido all the way down, focus on what they do and work on what they do with the very best of intentions, prioritizing what they see as important, making the best use of the resources they have as they see. Unfortunately, it isn't always obvious that this is well understood. Let's come back to this foundational question. What is Python? 
More specifically, why does the core team change what Python is? Why do they add new syntax or new operators or new standard library features? Because they want the language to get better. They see patterns of usage that are prone to bugs or can be simplified. Take the with statement, for example. It is a syntactic representation of a pattern of usage. In use, it means that users don't forget to close files when they open them. The syntax change protects the user from resource leakage. The core team makes changes like this with the perspective of a group that is paying close attention to how the language is being used and abused in the real world. You may have noticed that your if it's something that you are responsible for gets a lot more of your attention than it would otherwise. If you are working on a product, you see all the little bugs and defects that average users just don't see. The Python core team, they see that with Python. And they have considerable experience in the field. The problem is many of the proposals they make and, ch and implement are met with distaste, derision, and in some cases, outright hatred in, Py in the Python community mailing lists. When a new feature is announced, it is totally reasonable to have questions or concerns. Reasonable people can disagree about whether a specific change is good or bad. But reasonable people don't have to be assholes when they disagree. Uh, PEP 572, assignment expressions, I personally prefer the name the walrus operator, um, is being added in Python 3.8 as a shortcut for a common usage pattern where you call a function and then only handle the return value uh, if the return value is truthy. This is especially how useful in for loops, uh, sorry, in, in, uh, in loops, because you don't have to duplicate the logic to get the looping condition. Less code means, uh, means less bugs. But when Guido announced that he'd accepted PEP 572, the aftermath was bad. Really, really bad. So bad that Guido resigned as BDFL. We, as a community, broke Guido. And OK, he did say in his resignation email that he wasn't just about that PEP. He was reducing the bus factor and acknowledging that he's not getting any younger. And he's a member of the technical advisory panel that has replaced the BDFL's role. But a key factor in his resignation was the backlash against accepting a PEP. And that was a PEP that was being discussed in public, that had been formally under discussion for six months, informally for longer. And yet when the PEP landed at the end of that debate, that was when people came out of the woodwork to pile on about how Guido was destroying Python. If you think that I'm you know, overstating what was, going to say, what, what was being said there, go back and read the mailing list. It's toxic. We took someone who dedicated 25 years of his life to making our professional lives better, and we broke him. If that doesn't give you pause to reflect on everything you have ever said online, how you've said it, how you have expressed dissent, frankly, you need a wake-up call. I am lucky that I have never had to deal with the sort of hatred that Guido received, but I have been a part of online communities for 30 years. I've been a maintainer of online communities for almost 15. I am here to tell you, dealing with people in this way is emotionally exhausting. The sense of entitlement that some people seem to have around something that they have received at no cost and without any obligation to give back is, quite frankly, phenomenal. And over time, those pressures add up. And when, when you're doing all that emotional labor as a volunteer, it makes you question why you bother at all. My personal experience, I was diagnosed as being in the middle of a major depressive episode in early 2015. And as with Guido's case, there were a number of contributing factors, but one of the big ones was the pressures imposed by my volunteer work dealing with the Django community, and in particular, dealing with code of conduct issues and one code of conduct issue in particular. I burned out on the Django community. I'm still part of that community because of the many amazing friends that I've made, but I don't actively contribute to the Django community anywhere near as much as I once did. I fully expect the Python core team will continue to add new features to the language or make changes to the way it operates. If Python ever stops changing, I imagine that will be a signal that the language itself is in danger. And as the core team contemplates new proposals, they have to weigh up benefits and consequences of the changes they're proposing. Language design is an art. There are no right and wrong answers, just a series of compromises. I know the Python core team doesn't rush into anything. They've got, they know the magnitude of the thing that they are responsible for. And they've got enough breadth of experience on the team, enough track record of careful consideration that I think it is fair to say we can trust their judgment. The problems of which features to add, not to add to the language, how to support or not support Windows or mobile platforms, these are technical questions. As a community, we're going to continue to have discussions about asynchronous handling and syntax additions, other technical problems. But they are solvable technical problems. 
I certainly have opinions about how some of them should be solved, but I also have confidence in the core team and the rest of the Python community uh, will, can and will address them. The thing is, the hard problems faced by any community aren't technical. The hard problems are human problems, social problems, community problems, organisational problems. I certainly hope we don't ever see a repeat of the five, uh, PEP 572 mess ever again. People need to be able to express their concerns, but I don't want to see a debate that contributes to someone walking away from a project because of the sheer volume of vitriol that has been directed at them. Guido's departure has forced us to face maybe the biggest community problem of all, that of governance. How do we replace a BDFL, which we have now resolved with the Technical, uh, technical Advisory Board? Uh, if we are considering the future of Python, how the future will be governed is a big part of that question. Which brings us back to the original this question again. What is Python? For me, the most interesting answer is that more than anything, Python is a community. But in order to survive, a community has to be healthy. Everyone needs to feel that their views are being heard, their concerns are being addressed, that their fears aren't being exploited. Everyone needs to feel like their contributions are welcome. They need to feel enabled to actually contribute. They need to be respected while they contribute. It's true of civil society as much as it is of a software community. If we're expecting to grow as a community, then we need to make sure that these problems don't grow as well, or worse, amplify. But, in my opinion, our community, and open source communities in general, have a problem. And it stems from how our community supports itself. Who's actually doing the work here? What we see today as the Python community is the result of countless thousands of hours of largely volunteered effort. And being primarily software engineers, the question that gets the most immediate attention is who is going to write the software. Writing software takes a lot of effort, and doing it well takes time and skill. But that's only considering the code. Any project, especially one the size of Python, is so much more than the code. Project and team management is a skill. Too often we assume that good engineers will somehow magically transition into being good managers, and we all know that's not true. Who does the graphic and interface design work for your project? Designing a good logo or a good website is a skill, and your average open source project logo or website will show you that most engineers do not have that skill. Developer relations is a skill. DevRel is a role that extroverted engineers sometimes fall into, but it is a distinct set of skills, mostly related to effective technical communication. Speaking of communication, who writes the documentation? Technical writing is a skill. It's a skill that most engineers should practice a lot more than they do. But these are all skills that could be broadly considered in the remit of a well-rounded software engineer. What about things that aren't remotely software related? Who organizes the community events? I know very few engineers who aspire to be professional event organizers. What about legal advice? Who advises on licenses and trademark law? Who writes cease and desist letters? Who provides advice on slander and libel in blog posts? What about public relations? Who writes the press release when a new version is released? Who makes sure the wider community is aware of the decisions being made by project leaders so big decisions like PEP 572 don't come as a shock? Who does fundraising? Who builds the relationships with large potential donors? Who builds relationships with philanthropic and government groups that offer grants? Who writes the grant applications? When Microsoft or Google or Heroku or GitHub or whoever's about to launch a new big product, who makes the strategic deal to make sure Python is a supported language on day one? It turns out there are people in the world who can't program, but they have remarkable skills that are very, very useful. If a lawyer announced tomorrow they were going to write their own version of Google, you can bet that every engineer who heard the story would laugh. And yet, we expect software engineers to provide their own legal advice. And we expect them to write their software for free. I don't for a second want to discount the incredible efforts that volunteers have put into Python and other open source communities. But there are some things that are done better if you have someone whose job it is to look after those things, and whose training has prepared them to do those things. If you find people who have expertise, they can use that expertise to help you. However, these experts, they kind of expect to get paid. From inside the bubble of open source software development, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that some of the cultural norms we see aren't normal in any other industry. Open source software is an industry where it is apparently expected that having worked your nine to five day job doing something you're skilled at, you'll go home and do some more for free and encourage multi-million dollar organizations to benefit from your efforts. In most, most industries, if you are good at something, you get paid to do it. And people outside software have really useful skills. 
design, legal advice, event planning, fundraising, these are all useful skills and skills that many open source projects badly need. But it's true of the software industry as well. People are paid well to write software. And there's plenty of software that should be written, but isn't, or isn't written in a timely fashion because we're waiting for volunteers to do the job. Django is a web framework. It took the DSF over three years to coordinate the most recent redesign of its website. Why? Because if you need volunteers, you are immediately constraining the amount of time and effort anyone can put into the job. If you pay them, that problem goes away. More importantly, what opportunities have we left on the table because we didn't resource them adequately? What constraints have we placed on our own growth because nobody was enthusiastic enough to volunteer their time to address some gap or make the most of some opportunity? How many potential users has Python lost because the window installer was so bad for so long? Who have we excluded from the development process because they couldn't justify donating all their spare time to a volunteer effort? Our need for these expert skills and resources is only going to increase. If our community is going to keep growing, we're going to need more project and community management, more legal advice, more event organization, and more software development. And this isn't just about how to find, uh, finding out how to resource the things that we need as we grow, it's about how to mitigate the not insignificant costs we are already incurring. I've already mentioned two people, Guido and myself, who have burned out on some aspect of contributing to this community. I can think of dozens of others who have had very similar experiences. Are we as a community comfortable that we are doing this to our peers or our leaders or to anyone for that matter? Do we want to build our community on the expectation that volunteers will give of themselves until they burn out? Or do we want to find a way to make sure that people who are able to do good work in our community have the resources to do that work well and access to others with skills in other areas? This, unfortunately, brings up a very uncomfortable question for the Python community and more broadly, free and open source. I've been saying resources here, but let's be clear. What we're really talking about, the big resource, is human resources, people. And what we're really talking about there is money. People aren't resources. Their labor is a resource. And in a fair economy, it's a resource that they need to be paid for. But if someone's going to be paid, someone needs to be doing the paying. The messy questions of free and open source is who pays? Whose responsibility is it to shoulder the burden of this work? What do they pay for? How do they pay? It's not enough to just throw out your hat for donations because that mode of payment doesn't fit into the accounting structures of a large organization. If you want to extract money from a large organization, you have to structure your ask in a way that is compatible with their accounting needs. How do we do this? Well, funding open source projects is a talk unto itself, one that I've given elsewhere, but unfortunately, I have never found a good answer. If there were good answers, the DSF would be a well-funded institution, not a volunteer organization run on a budget that is tiny compared to an even an early stage startup, and the PSF would be in a similar boat. Uh, a recent discovery I've made is this actually an area of active academic uh, economics research. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom won the 2009 Nobel Prize for Economics for her study of what are called common pool resources, or CPRs. Real-world examples of CPRs are things like forests, uh, grazing lands, uh, fishing grounds, irrigation channels. Uh, but open source fits into this same mold. A CPR is a situation where anyone is able to access the resource. The best individual strategy is to use that resource as much as you can. But the best communal structure is to collaborate, to limit what you take, and to contribute back to maintaining that resource so that in the long run, the health and productivity of the resource is maximized. Ostrom's work looked at examples of common pool resources that are being already managed in the real world. Some of them, uh, grazing and forestry rights in Switzerland and Japan, Huerta irrigation uh, institutions in eastern Spain, these have been collectively operated and maintained for hundreds of years. I don't know if CPRs can be adapted to open source, but it's certainly an area worth exploring. And if we do, we may have to make some unpleasant decisions about who we allow to participate in our communities, on what terms, and even about who we exclude from our communities. 
But we can't ignore the problem. Anyone paying attention can see repeated patterns. I have seen projects flounder because maintainers can't get enough clear air to do essential maintenance or to address a strategic gap. I have seen projects fail to reach their potential or take far too long to reach that potential because they can't attract the volunteers they need. And I've seen far too many open source contributors burn out from the workload imposed by their volunteer work. We have these problems at the level of Python. We have them at the scale of large projects in the Python ecosystem, like Django. We see them in smaller projects, like in the Python and Django ecosystem. And we see them in emerging projects, like Beware. As people who are engineers, we have a blind spot. When we discuss software, we discuss the technical aspects, because that's where our expertise lies. We focus on the software, but not on how the software is made. The free and open source software movement stems from questions about what users should be able to do with their software. The freedom to share and modify that software is key. That, com that conversation, however, focuses the on the freedoms that we must have as engineers and as software users. And I completely agree that these freedoms are important. But let me ask this. What price is too high? If free software induces or encourages people to burn out, is that acceptable? If there isn't equity of access to the development process, if the institutions around free software systematically prevent minorities from engaging with those communities, what is the point of having the freedom in the first place? We can't afford to focus on software freedom to the exclusion of other factors. In order to have those software, that software freedom, the software needs to exist. We need to be having a discussion about the processes by which we produce this software and maintain the communities around them. So what is to be done? Well, fellow Pythonista, I call you to action. Firstly, the current structures for funding open source may not be ideal, but they're what we've got. When you go back to your place of work on Monday to work at a company that's using Python, or any other open source project for that matter, projects that are vital for your company's infrastructure, tell your manager they need to get out their freaking wallet. Ask them to donate to the governing organizations that manage the projects you use. And not just a once-off $100 donation either. Try to get them to make a substantial, regular, ongoing donation. Something that is reflective of the extent to which open source is used by your organization. Having said that, I know this isn't an easy conversation to have. My advice is to reframe the discussion. Technically, what the PSF and the DSF are asking for is a donation. You're not asking, though, for a donation. What you are trying to do is manage institutional risk. If you are a corporate organization, a commercial organization, who depends on an open source project for your livelihood, and you are not taking steps to contribute to that project, then I would argue you are being criminally negligent to your investors because you have not secured your supply chain. You have not mitigated a key risk associated with your technology stack. If you use Python and you are not funding the maintenance of Python, what is your company's plan for resor for, to resource rewriting your entire stack because Python is no longer tenable because the stream of volunteers has dried up? Investing a small amount of money now is a hedge against future catastrophes. Secondly, second call to action, start thinking about where Python is going, not just the minute about individual peps either, the big picture about how and where we're using Python, where we could be using Python, where we should be using Python, and more importantly, where we can't use Python, but we need to. If we turn around in 10 years and discover that Python usage is dropping because nobody has a device that can run Python, or because Python doesn't solve problems that people actually have anymore, we'll have nobody to blame but ourselves. We can all see what's happening in our industry. We need to make and follow through on strategic plans for the future. And we need to factor those strategic plans into how we manage our community, or the future will swallow us whole. My last call to action is a longer term one. As a community, we need to start talking about our community's relationship with money, or more generally, how we provide the resources to develop the software that we are using. As a community, we haven't established the conditions where companies are readily able to contribute. We haven't provided the conditions that make it, make it clear that donating to the PSF or any other organization will, in fact, mitigate your strategic risk. We haven't provided the conditions that enable organizations to pay and to structure that payment on their accounts in a way that will satisfy their accountants. And we haven't set up structures that enable our communities to use that money when it is readily available. 
It's not enough to just need money. We have to rethink what we're providing and the way we're providing it and how we structure that offering in a way that is palatable to those that are going to be paying for it. And part of that, I think we need to start thinking big thoughts about the future. For the most part, the Python we have today has been developed in the spare time of volunteers or whatever fragments of time engineers have been able to extract from their employers in the form of 20% time. What if it didn't have to be that way? What if Python had an R&D division, a permanent engineering group that could focus on strategic tasks for the Python ecosystem? When Bell Telephones gave a bunch of engineers the resources to engineer strategically, the world got Unix. When Xerox founded a team in Palo Alto to engineer strategically, we got Xerox Park, which gave us graphical user interfaces and Ethernet and laser printers. When you give a team of talented people the resources to think big, amazing things can happen. The Python community has plenty of talented people. We just need to give them the resources to think big thoughts and do big things. And I'm not saying that volunteer development or volunteer contributions should be eliminated from the process. The fact that anybody can get involved is a key benefit of the open source ethos. We shouldn't lose sight of that. But there are jobs like project management, public relations, large scale strategic development that need to be funded much better than they are at present. And in some cases, they need to be funded at all. Nine women can't make a baby in one month. Sometimes a job requires the prolonged, focused attention of a single person. It can't be squeezed into weekend volunteer time. It can't be done in 20% time. It needs dedicated full-time resources. And that means, means funding people. And in case you weren't a believer in that, we've had some very recent demonstrations that shows that money makes things happen. PyPI has been around for 15 years. It has badly needed a rewrite for almost half of that lifespan. Everyone agreed that it need, that rewrite was needed, but the work never got finished. Why? because nobody was being paid to work on it. Then, Mozilla gave the PSF a grant of $170,000, and the work was done in six months. Why? Because a couple of people could focus on getting the job done, instead of trying to fit in, fit in bug fixes on weekends between their kids' football games. Money isn't everything, but money is a very, very useful thing. Can we use Mozilla's investment in our community as a model for how we can further other strategic goals for Python? We need to start having these conversations. And there is a second benefit to this approach. It broadens the list of people who can do the work. Volunteers, by definition, are made up by those who have the time to volunteer. If you have family or children or loved ones that need care, those commitments take priority, as well they should. But that inherently limits your ability to volunteer. You want to address diversity in this community? Make sure that you're not just taking volunteers from the pool of people who have copious free time, which, broadly speaking, means white, middle class, up, uh, uh, middle to upper class, white men aged 16 to 30. If you were to fund strategic work on Python, not only can we ensure the long-term future of Python, we can make our community stronger and provide an example to the rest of the world of the benefits that come from having a diverse community. So, what does the future hold for Python? I have outlined what I think are some of the threats and opportunities, but I am just one guy. What I do know, though, is if we want Python to continue to be a force in the world of computing, we can't stand still. We need to prepare for ways that computing platforms are changing. We need to make sure that our communities are healthy and diverse and respectful and vibrant places where everyone can collaborate. We need to make sure that strategic goals can be addressed. Personally, uh, I'm going to keep working on Beware, the umbrella project covering tools to get Python running on new computing pl platforms like phones and tablets. I'd like to think I'm not alone in wanting this, but without some sort of external financial support, that's going to continue to be a hobby project. And without more substantial engagement from the community, it's going to take forever to reach a point where it's a viable option for using Python on mobile. If you do like what I'm doing, the Beware project does sell memberships. Uh, if I can get enough financial support, then I can start working on Beware full time. If you've got any other novel ideas on how to maybe fund that work, please come find me, because I definitely want to have that conversation. Political philosopher Max Weber once wrote, politics is a strong and slow boring of hard boards. It takes both passion and perspective. Certainly, all historical experience confirms the truth that humankind would not have achieved the possible unless time and again it had reached out for the impossible. All human activity involving more than one person is inherently political. And beware, Django, Python, free software in general, these are impossible things. The idea of a community working collaboratively on software to make something we can all use and understand, it is important to remember how radical an idea that is. And it does work. 
It has produced world-class software. It makes software accessible to audiences that wouldn't previously have had, a, had access, and it has allowed a worldwide community to develop, sharing knowledge and experience, making the world a better place. I am speaking to part of that community today. It has taken 30 years of effort, but the benefits of that effort are undeniable. I have personally benefited from being part of a large and successful project like Django. I would like to see similar success with Beware. Only time will tell if that happens. Uh, but both of these projects wouldn't have been possible, or at least would have been significantly different if it wasn't for the groundwork laid out by the Python and Python communities. Uh, I'm very keen to make sure that groundwork doesn't go away. It has taken 25, 30 years to get where we are today, and it would be a shame to have to develop it all over again simply because we didn't pay attention to the way the world was changing around us and plan for how tomorrow's Python is going to fit into the future that is evolving around us. And as the Python language grows and adapts, we need to make sure that our community grows and adapts as well. This awesome language we all know and love would be nothing without the community of people behind it. And as that community grows, I want to see it grow from strength to strength. Muchas gracias. Thanks a lot for the talk, Russell. So we have some time for questions, like 10 minutes. So raise your hand, please. Hi, Russell. Hey. So uh, you mentioned at the start that, that one of Python's kind of advantages is the fact it's not beholden to, to any platform or any company. Mm -hmm. Is there a risk of um, seeking out sponsorship from, from larger corporations that that would go away? Uh, so there's two potential risks there. One is that it is given over to the control of a single company. A company X, be it Microsoft or Google or anyone else, comes in, decides they're going to single-handedly fund all the core developers, and then it becomes their language. Even though it's open source, they're controlling everything, they've got an effective veto. So that is, that is one potential risk. There is also the sort of if you have four or five large companies who act as a cabal, that large big end, big end of town engineering might end up driving the language in a direction that makes it not as useful for the little end of town. So those two, those two risks, yes, absolutely do, do exist. Uh, and part of the governance problem is trying to work out how do you structure the community such that we can get their money without necessarily having to cede complete control to them. That said, it may be necessary to cede some control to them over some things. What exactly that constitutes, I don't know. I don't know that I have a, a concrete answer. But the, the absolute position of there must be no corporate involvement is not a helpful position because, like it or not, large corporates use our software. So they need to be involved. We just need to make sure we don't divest all of our control in exchange for the money to get the job done. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, hello. Uh, I have a question about, um, uh, now that you say that money is really important to grow an uh, open source project and, and keep the community, the community running. To be clear, I don't say that money is okay. important. Having the resources in, is important, and how we get the resources is money, because that's how our economy works. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, the idea is similar. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, so do you think that location also matters? Because, I mean, if someone is trying to start a community in up in Bay Area, probably you will have more resources than if you are in any other place in the world. Do you, what, what do you think about the location? Uh, Did you see that map earlier? Uh, I come yeah. from what is collectively known as the most isolated capital city in the world. Uh, from my hometown, it is a three-hour flight to the nearest state capital and a five-hour flight to the nearest national capital. I am, by every definition, out in the middle of nowhere, and yet I am part of a worldwide community. Location is helpful if you want to physically get people in one space, and the fact that I had to fly 38 hours to get here is certainly not an experience that I enjoy. I enjoy being here. The flights, however, can get knotted. Um, but location isn't inherently a problem. We have these computer things. They're very good at communicating with people all over the planet. I work from Perth. I live in Perth. The company I work for is based in San Francisco. I get several hours a day where I get to work face to face with those people. I'm not physically in the same room, but we have fantastic conversations about how engineering can go forward. Absolutely, it imposes its own difficulties and constraints. But 
it's not the end of the world. There are ways to manage uh, remoteness and distribution, geographical distribution of a community, and still have a strong community. And I think, if anything, open source communities are a great example of that. The Django community, I was a contributor to Django for something like three or four years before I met a single member of the Django core team. And there was another Django core team member living in Australia. I was able to do that collaboration for years without ever having to meet any of them face to face. It can be done, but there are different constraints. But there are constraints if you're actually physically in the same city too. You know, the, the opportunistic just bumping, some, bumping into someone at the coffee cart doesn't happen if you're not in the same city as the coffee cart. But there are other ways to make that serendipitous stuff happen. So it's not the end of the world. There are challenges associated. Cool. Thank you so much. Okay. We've got one at the back there. Uh, so there are a few different models that have popped up to sort of solve this issue, namely uh, Git tip and support contracts like Red Hat style. Uh -huh. Which one do you see being having the most potential for the Python community in particular? Because it might be difficult for Python as a language to provide a support contract, but maybe they could do something similar with a formal contract between the PSF and various companies that use Python. Sure. Okay. So the Git tip model, um, or Git tip no longer exists, but the the sort of the small contributions model is interesting and appealing. I am slightly concerned about it on the basis that it seems to place the focus on individuals placing donations. You know, I donate ten dollars to make sure Python is healthy, and that's great. But my employer should be the one who's paying a large amount of money. I should be paying if I am using Python for my hobby game project or something. My employer should be paying for the Python they are using as part of the multi-billion-dollar company that they're building. Not saying Savada there specifically, you know, employer in the general sense. Um, the so I, I am, I'm a little concerned about the, the, the micro-tipping aspect, focusing on individual contributions rather than the corporate angle. The corporate support contract one is, a, is an interesting one. That is one that gets floated all the time as we can, main, we can maintain our community with support contracts. The question is, what are you supporting and how do you support and what guarantees do you provide? Because selling, like actually setting up the infrastructure to sell those contracts is non-trivial. Like Red Hat is not a company of engineers, it's a red, it's a, there are engineers in the company, but there's a lot of other resources there. And that infrastructure doesn't happen overnight. How do you bootstrap that process? And when you do, what, con what, what support are you selling? You know, okay, so Django is a web framework. What guarantees do you as a large multinational corporation using Google, uh, using, using Django, what guarantees do you want Django to give you that they wouldn't be giving you anyway? You know, timely response to bug reports? Well, that's what they do. Timely response to security issues? Well, that's what they do. What's the, what is the new thing that you are getting that you would not get otherwise? And a lot of the, that sort of corporate support model is, uh, is predicated on undermining what the open source community needs to do anyway to have a successful project. You, know, you can't stop providing security updates. If your project is difficult to install, that's great for support and, and consulting revenue, but it means that nobody uses your product and you're disincentivized to actually make your product easier to install. If your documentation is really bad, that means it's hard for your product to use. But that also means if you make the documentation better, it's a lot harder to sell documentation as a service. Interesting uh, uh, anecdote, for many years, it was very, very hard to get uh, publishers to publish books about Django because Django's documentation was too good. J uh, publishers thought that the market for books in Django was undermined by Django's own documentation. And that's a really good example of how doing the right thing as a software community actually undermines your ability to make money. And making money is then how you pay for the software. So how do we make the software better without undermining making the software better? This is the open question. All right. Is that it? Well, I have a question. Oh, OK. So what percentage of a project on the ones your work or even in Beware should be, let's say, your time? How much time you should devote to coding to encourage um, the use of the make of sprints to introduce new developers or looking for money with big companies or writing the documentation so beginners can join the project? Because 
all those seem to compete at some point. Absolutely. No more so than they do in any engineering organization. Um, you know, uh, to, a, to some extent, that, I think that needs to be a personal decision not a, and not a project. Well, there is a project level answer and there's an individual answer. As a project, you need to do as much documentation, user outreach, support, new development as is necessary for your project as a whole. I don't know that I can put a it's 25% number on that because it will vary from project to project. As an individual, you should be able to do whatever is necessary or whatever you are being paid to do if it's, a, if it's actually something that you're, you're employed to do. You know, if you are paid as a customer support engineer, then you know, it's kind of your job to do customer support and onboarding, so maybe you should do that and do what you're being paid for. But that doesn't mean that you have to personally take up a job as a customer support engineer. So as an individual, do what actually makes sense to you. Volunteer your time where you feel comfortable contributing. Get paid to do work that you feel comfortable being, uh, being paid to do. As a project, you, as a project level, you need to determine what, the, what is appropriate for your project. Hey, take this one. Hi. Hola. Uh, there is anything you could have done to avoid the burnout of uh, contributor in the project of Django or anyone else in the open source community? Um, so that's a hard question to answer um, because it is ultimately a very personal one. I, I have given a talk, um, if you want to search on, online for I am not a doctor, there's a talk that I gave uh, at DjangoCon US um, in 2015. Um, Identifying your own sources, your, your own triggers, identifying, be, being, being self-aware and knowing who you are and what your triggers are and what the signs are that you are not dealing with things well uh, is the immediate answer to that. Um, I am now, as a result of the therapy and things that came out of my depressive episode, I'm now much more aware of what is going on in my head. Um, and I wish 2019 Russell could talk to 2013 Russell about that. Uh, to help avoid some of those problems. And some of that means knowing when to walk away and when to hand off. And as a community, making it more acceptable to walk away from things, uh, providing the frameworks for that to happen. Uh, one of the after interesting aftermaths of my depressive episode uh, was that I did step down as DSF president. Um, and in subsequent discussions that were happening about the structure of the, Pyth of the Django core team, I was very much advocating the idea that, um, uh, that any position that we have is not until the end of time. It's not like benevolent dictator for life is actually an anti-pattern because for life doesn't have an endpoint. Um, but if you say this is a one year position or it's a, you know, until the next release position, you have then institutionalized the expectation that at the end of that period, we're going to ask, are you sure you want to keep going? And that's a big change. That's an important distinction. Making that, that regular check-in to say, are you OK continuing? Do you actually want to continue, or are you doing this out of a sense of obligation? That's a, that's a big change that I, uh, well, the, 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 D, the PSF no longer has that problem because Guido has stepped down as B, uh, BDFL. A lot of the other structures around the PSF and the DSF are inherently time limited. But if you are in a project or in, a, in an open source community where there isn't a natural exit point, that's one big change that I would suggest you should, you should definitely take a look at. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for the talk, okay. a really good talk. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, you talk about, well, uh, we are, as a community, uh, in the process of growing, we must uh, invite people of other areas to not only to learn how to use Python, but as you mentioned, to help us grow as a community, mm -hmm. to help us grow as a project. And how do you think we can do that uh, besides of uh, Telling them, uh, for example, someone, a lawyer, uh, I can pay you for do this, but how can we invite them to collaborate? Um, I actually think that's the exact that's exactly the wrong way to look at it. Um, we shouldn't be asking a lawyer, graphic artist, whoever, to volunteer their time to our to our benefit. 
I think we should be structuring our communities in such a way that we can pay them to what they, for what they do. I think the anti-pattern we have is that we expect that software developers will work for free and for whatever daft reasons for some reason we do. Uh, so therefore everyone else should work for free. And that's not how everyone else expects things to operate. I think we need to switch that operation of the expectation of free labour so that if you wish to contribute free, free labour, go right ahead. Now, if, you want to, if you do want to contribute something or you think that's a valuable way of improving your community or whatever, go right ahead and do that. But if there is something that is actually needed by the community, then that can be paid for, that it's not draining everyone's volunteer resources to do that. And that then means when the lawyers get involved or the artists get involved or whatever, that they are paid and respected, their time and resources are respected, just as much as the software engineers should be. Hey. Hi, Roman Poroshenko here. Hey. So, uh, you said that the, there's always a chance that one company donates a lot, well, not donates, that pays a lot to a PSF or mm -hmm. another institution that makes Python and then gains too much control of that and drives Python in their direction. Yes. Uh, however, you know, there is another situation and uh, it happens in the real world. In, let's say OpenStack Software Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, which has a lot of funding from different companies, and it has money for designers, for lawyers, for all other people who work for money. But then, uh, all those companies actually expect from the community to do something, and they pursue their interest. They have their people working in that community for money, uh, and that often causes the situation that different company pull uh, OpenStack into different direction, and it moves nowhere. So I, I completely agree, yeah. So there is a, there, there, it is a very delicate balance to hold. Uh, and and it, in, in the sense of a company or many companies having uh, control, that is a risk. Um, I don't know that I have a single answer. I think you're right in that like, OpenStack did demonstrate that it's not just enough to say we're going to give lots of companies control because even though there's 10 of them, each one of them thinks that they're in full control and they keep pulling in different directions. So there is a, there is a balancing act there between giving, getting those companies money uh, and giving them enough of a voice that they feel that giving the money is worthwhile while not ceding absolute direction to them. So there, you need to be able to keep the engineering priorities something that is determined by the project, managed by the project, certainly you know, influenced by what the donors are saying needs to happen, but not completely at their discretion. By, by donating money, they don't automatically get control of the project. The project as a whole needs to have governance structures that allow you to set a direction and say, this is what we're going to do.